was that the toughest loss of your career? And I have never felt so much pressure in my life. Like Victor, no, I was so good uh, football player before. What is happening in the last years with these uh, players? Ball across to Dylan Nahi, double in flight. Oh, what a start. Ooh, yeah. Into the net. He does it again. Yes, I'm going to work. On the shot. It is time to talk handball again. Friday, 20th of October for us at the recording, 1520. Um, and uh, I would say, me, myself, uh, Ben Kunkel, I am joined by two great hosts uh, today once again. That is, on one hand, the champion of the champion, the guy who has won it, the <laughs> champion of Europe, the best beach handball player that you will ever find, Martin Vilstrup. And the guy who breaks his spine playing paddle, Victor Thomas. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I like this one. I like this introduction. Yeah, it's probably the best one that you yeah. heard yet, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, I also come to a conclusion that I'm not going to compare my introductions with Victor because uh, yeah, I have a gold medal, but it's nothing to brag about compared to Victor. So um, it's just another one. <laughs> I guess uh, Victor can stay on that. It's just another one. More to come, right? <laughs> but I mean, uh, it's the first uh, episode after you winning your uh, your gold medal. Why aren't you wearing it, Martin? Nah, I thought you would ask for it, so I actually brought it with me just to, oh, to yes. show it to you. Oh, <laughs> yes. We love to see and it. And then I thought oh, about just it. As casually, I just casually, he had it on the table, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Oops, oh well, that's just one of my, yeah, my uh, 15 okay. gold medals that are lying around. I need some space for them. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and I was thinking about, should I wear it or should I not? What, will it be too much? And then I came to the conclusion that a true winner, he doesn't wear his gold medals. He, he doesn't count them, you know. So I just have them casual laying, uh, laying by my side. Have, haven't you seen these pictures of Michael Phelps with seven gold medals of, from the Olympics, you know? So, <laughs> Just as Martin said, he ain't a real champion then. He ain't no. a real champion because <laughs> a real either. champion doesn't wear them. Uh, but Victor, oh. uh, maybe comparing to that, do you know how many gold medals you have? Uh, no. No. True champion. True champion. Martin, <laughs> your uh, <laughs> conclusion came came down uh, properly. Um, but yeah. actually, let's let's talk a little bit about it because uh, it is a great a great title that you won there last week in Porto Santo. Um, tell us a little bit about your uh, your final day journey. Well, um, first of all, I'm glad that I got to keep my word. I also said it in the interview afterwards to you guys that we actually had a chance to win it. It was not just empty words. Uh, but when we we won it, we had around an, an hour to, to shoot some pictures uh, with us with the medals on and the trophy. And then we went directly to the boat and um, we had... I think 23 hours later, I was at home. We took a taxi to the boat. Then when we arrived in Madeira, we took a taxi to the airport, slept in the airport, and then to London, and then from London to Denmark, and then with a car back home. So it's nothing to actually tell about. Normally, uh, I would uh, say that we're pretty good at celebrating, but uh, this time we had to postpone it to another time. When will that other time be? Will it be uh, like a Christmas celebration for you guys, or...? It could uh, be combined with a Christmas celebration, so uh, we do two in once. But uh, yeah, um, it's actually sad that we didn't go to. But uh, Porto Santo is an island that is uh, pretty hard to get to. So whenever we had the chance to get home, we we had to. And I know there were other teams that did the same. So uh, yeah, we will but, celebrate another time. But I mean, your uh, our wisdom from last week uh, it actually ended up being true because. Uh, what used to be red, it did turn brown. So uh, he, he brought a gold medal and a nice skin color, you know, to Denmark. <laughs> He's the, the better tanned man in Denmark in October ever. Yeah. <laughs> what does that to you, Martin? Oh, well, I'm happy about it because at the moment we're having a storm in Denmark and um, yeah, they closed the bridges and uh, also the boats are canceled here in Denmark. So be brown uh, in. Middle end October, it, um, it's not that bad. 
and also being a champion, champion and brown. Champion um, of the champions and brown. Don't uh, talk yourself <laughs> small here. I, I was just about to say. Um, but still, uh, weather, I just checked it actually. In Barcelona, it ain't too bad either. So uh, you're at 22 degrees still. Um, Victor, can you make use of it? Or uh, do you are you just like, yeah, well, 22 degrees. I need to get my coat out. You, you know what? I'm a cold lover. So actually, uh, as you know, my wife is from Norway. When I go there, I always say, oh, I love the weather here in Norway. I, I know a lot of people is going to hate me now, but uh, uh, it's too warm. It's too warm. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Well, but I mean, you do have the beach in Barcelona, don't you? We do have it. Yes. And the mountain. Do you go to the beach at all in the city? Uh, only go for a lunch or something, not to just lay down on the sand and, and enjoy a, ba a, a, a beach day there. Oh, no, actually, not, not in the city. But uh, you do that kind of stuff uh, somewhere else, don't you? Or aren't you just yeah, not I a do. beach goer at all? Oh, it's way too warm on the beach. I don't like it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I do. I, I go to a place. It's quite close to Barcelona, just 20, 20 minutes driving. It called, it's called Castell de Fels. Uh, the beach is, is, is calmer, you know, here in the beach, it's a lot of people uh, trying to sell you a lot of things and, and you cannot relax. So the whole purpose to, to go to the beach is to relax a little bit and you cannot do it in the city. All right. So what I learned about Barcelona in this podcast right now is uh, your bike gets <laughs> stolen and people try to sell you stuff on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> we, we only we have can, six we, degrees in Denmark. In, in, in the next episodes, we can dip more into the city life, you know? In yeah, we have yeah. plenty of time to uh, discuss about uh, how, it's, uh, how it's looking like in, in Barcelona. Martin, when was the last time that you went? Have you ever been to Barcelona? I actually don't think I've ever been to Barcelona, if I think it through. Um, but it, when it's 22 degrees, maybe I should go there sometimes because we only have six degrees here in Denmark. And six? Victor's saying, yeah, six. Oh, yeah, and Victor's saying he loves the Norwegian weather. I remember when I played an away game against, I actually think it was against Elverum or uh, actually Kolstad has played the Champions League now. I think it was minus 10 or 12 or something like that degrees. And I can say that uh, pretty important to remember your jacket when you're going on a away game because minus 12 is something different. Yeah. Have you ever had snow in uh, by, at Christmas in uh, Barcelona, uh, Victor? Ah, in the city, uh, uh, maybe the last time it, it, it uh, snowed in the city, it was like 15, 20 years ago. I remember, of course, but uh, it's so long ago. But actually here we have, we have the Pyrenees quite close of the city. It's like one hour, 40 minutes driving from here. So we can, we, we can have breakfast at the beach at nine and we can, we can ski at the mountains at 12 on the same day. <laughs> well uh what a way to to have your life and what a way uh, what a time to be alive what a time to be alive for us as well because uh today we are having a guest and a very very special guest he is one of the best at the minute to enter the handball stage um but injured um his team suffers under him uh, being injured because uh, his position is a little open right now. But uh, we will talk about that with him in a second because uh, just about to join us, Alex Dushabayev. I am super stoked to uh, be about to introduce him. Martin, is he the best right back in the world right now? It's going to be a controversial answer, but... Um... Um, and it's a little bit unfair, you know, to compare because there are so many different styles. The short answer is, I have to say, I think there is a Danish guy at the moment who's performing really well on the right back position named Matthias Gissel. Uh, but he doesn't play Champions League. So, um, and Alex, Alex is definitely up there. You know, um, he's one of the best in the world on his position. But at the moment, there are so many great right backs. Also, we also have Kai Smits, who's also a, maybe a topic for one of the best. Um, so, yeah, who is the best? That's hard to say, but he's definitely up there between the best of the best. 
Well, I mean, uh, Kai Smith, he still needs to find his form in his new club. I, I mean, it's uh, it's all right. It's uh, totally normal. Uh, but Victor, do you do you agree or how do you see it? Yeah, I agree with Martin that it's a difficult question because probably if there is a position at this moment that there are a lot of big, big players in the world is in the right back. Because uh, we have... You have uh, a mem a lot uh, of right backs. We have Dikamem, we have Remili, we have Melvin Richardson, yeah. we have Alex, uh, we have uh, Matthias Gitzel. Uh, so it's a lot of uh, impressive right backs uh, at this moment in the world. So it's quite, quite complicated to say who is the best. It definitely is, uh, but his name uh, definitely belongs into that row of names. Um, and that's why I would say uh, let's introduce him into the show. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Alex Dushabayev. Nice to have you here. Alex Dushabayev, how's it going? Hi. Hi everything fine. You? Uh, yeah, for us it's uh, going well, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, there is that question being posed to you because it's, uh, I think, three or four weeks ago that you had to step off the court. How's your injury going? It's going better, I think. Uh, I hope to be back in in a few weeks. I hope in two weeks, more or less, to be, to be ready to play again, to... To help my team and uh, we will see. It was a little tough to find out what was actually wrong there. So it's been two or three weeks when you stepped off the court being injured against Paris uh, and it just stated muscular injuries. So uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. What was wrong? Yeah, I had uh, the previous day I I got some, some small problems uh, also with the hamstring, but uh, I make all the tests and... I I checked with the physios and they told me that uh, everything was okay. Uh, we uh, we check on with some MRI, uh, some magnetic resonance, and all the test was good. And I tried to train the day before the the match, and uh, everything was good. But of course, it's not the the same the game, the match than than some training that you you don't put your hundred percent effort at the same point that uh, that the match and of course also when your body is tired after uh, some uh, some fast uh, situations it's a little bit difficult and i just i just uh, feel at that moment that uh, when i when i jump in this uh, in this situation that uh, something was uh, was bad was wrong with uh, that uh, left hamstring and uh, of course i i leave the court well, but I mean, uh, you are on your way back to full strength and that is uh, nice to see and nice to hear. So uh, we wish you a, a quick recovery uh, for now. But uh, maybe just looking at the three of us having a call with you, there's one face that you do recognize quite well. It was the guy who got in touch uh, with you to <laughs> um, basically get you into the podcast. Uh, it's the one to my right hand side, Victor Thomas. How, you, how close are you guys still in contact? Mm, now, now we are we are on weather touch. <laughs> no, no, I think Victor is for sure a big name on handball. I I always get the great experiences to play with him on national team, and uh, I think it's quite a, just a, a legend on handball. And I always uh, on very good mood when I meet him. Uh, I think it's a great guy that always uh, it's a uh, it's also it's. Uh, it's so so friendly so closely when when you go uh, to some events uh, when you meet him in barcelona in some final four in some different stuff it's always a a very nice guy and uh, i'm always happy to, to talk with him <laughs> i always say yes for a drink or a beer you know <laughs> <laughs> but but victor is actually that old that he played against your father he told me before the show he played the champs league final uh, against your father he's he played old, against victor. both <laughs> <laughs> maybe the maybe this was the moment that he decided that uh, the retirement was closer. <laughs> when... <laughs> uh, oh, Martin, my God! Yes, actually, I have good memories playing against one of the uh, players that I looked up to in my childhood. It was Talan Dutchevayev, and it was for me a great, great honor to play against him. Uh, 
he was a he still is an amazing character in in handball but on, on that time you know he was the big big star in in handball and after several years i i i i you know could play with alex in the national team and then yeah that made me think okay now the time is uh, is flying quite fast but uh, you might be able to compare it because, uh, as you said, you shared the stage uh, on the highest level with him, uh, with Victor, uh, in the national team, but you were opponents on club level. Is Victor Tomas a better opponent or a better teammate? <laughs> I think uh, it's better to have in your team. It's, it's this kind of guy that you prefer to have uh, on your side that, that not against. Uh, how is it playing against him? Is he a little shy talker? <laughs> okay, he he like he like he he know he know that uh, of course uh, also in, in Barça he have uh, he was for sure the captain he have this this kind of uh, respect level of respect that uh, he maybe can talk a little bit more or he can uh, argue with the with the <laughs> referees you know and it's like uh... <laughs> experience experience <laughs> you know. Yeah, for you sure, know, sure. I, 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 as Alex is saying, I I was a player that I always liked it, the you know the juice a little bit and to to speak with referees, to speak with uh, uh, rivals, and I always like it. I think it's part of the of the fun. Yeah, most likely. Um, but uh, part of the fun. What's uh, your favorite memory together with Victor? Oof. I don't remember. I right don't now it's difficult. <laughs> no, no, really, I, I, I was I not. We, we, I, we don't, played, I don't remember. We played together in Poland in the European Championship, I think. Uh, that championship it yeah. ended up it ended up bad because the final against Germany was quite uh, quite bad, uh, but. We got the silver silver medal as European in the European Championship, and that I think that could be one of the best ones. In my opinion, yeah, for sure. Always, <laughs> always to get some medals is good. It's, it's, it's good memories. <laughs> well, getting medals uh, will be a topic for you guys uh, in June again, because uh, after standing in the final for two times in a row now. Um, but not winning those finals. Can there be any other goals for Kielsa other than winning it? Mm, no, for sure. Our goal is to win, like uh, like always. But uh, everyone knows how difficult it is. Everyone who is involved is... No, it's just one winner. And uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the rest are foilers. It's simply that uh, the sport is like that. I think uh, we are a great team we are one of the favorites maybe but it's also another another very good teams very big teams uh, like you know Barça, Kiel, Paris, uh, West Prem, uh, I don't know a lot uh, now these uh, new teams the uh, more recent teams like uh, Olborg or Kolstad it's a lot of really quality teams that all have the same goal and uh, it's difficult when yeah, you know that uh, just one can reach this goal. It doesn't mean that you don't make the things good or that you are not in the right way. Just it uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's just a little details will, will be the difference between win or lose. I have to tell you, Alex, that you have a big responsibility this season because uh, I'm sure you don't know, but in the first episode of this podcast, we made some uh, uh, predictions, you know, <laughs> and and banked okay. banked predi banked prediction was all in for Kielce. So he said, "You are going to win the Champions League. Simon is going to be top scorer. You will be MVP." So, <laughs> so you have a big responsibility. Not I can not, say. I can say. Okay, not, like not only not only <laughs> not only to the fans of Kielce, to your family, to your teammates, or to your people. The biggest res responsibility you have this season is with Bengt. And to this podcast, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> okay, okay. Now I know. Now we're okay. ready. <laughs> uh, but actually, how close do you follow all these other teams that you just uh, talked about? Because, I mean, you guys are playing in Group A, um, and it seems to be the tougher group of uh, the two because... Uh, 
as you said it, you guys are some of the favorites, um, but still only in uh, spot number six after match day uh, number five. Um, how close do you follow uh, all those all Borgs, all those keels uh, in your group? No, really, I think uh, we maybe don't don't start uh, as good as uh, we would like, but uh, mm, really our group I think is really tough, especially the the matches away when you go. F it doesn't mean which arena. It will be so so tough to get these two points. I think all the teams in in our groups, especially in the in their arenas, are so tough. And uh, we will have to, to keep our points uh, at home, for sure. And I think uh, maybe this season is the first that uh, I think in the past two seasons, we just lose one game against Barca. And it was almost done because it was last season to, to know who was. It was almost Barca was first and we were second of our group. And I think these two two last seasons we don't we don't lose any points uh, just this of Barca and this season we almost lose three points like uh, the the draw yesterday and uh, this first game against Elborg and I think we have to to keep this level at home because for sure uh, the team that want to be in the final four have to be so strong at home and after for sure uh, when you go away but uh, to keep first of all keep your points at home and after try to win away every game every single game but for sure i think we have to build from there to to be to increase this level a little bit level at home because uh, you know maybe last seasons were like more or less good wins of our team at home and uh, then was of course easy for the confidence of everyone when you have to to play outside out of your home to play on, uh, in another arena And I mean, uh, you did talk about those uh, first losses and uh, yesterday the point that you lost in the draw. Um, it seems like you guys are a little bit on a roller coaster ride in the Champions League so far. What is lacking to gain a little more consistency? Mm, okay, I will be. I don't want to, to say it like that, but of course, uh, when you got. Uh, Uh, a lot of uh, okay a lot uh, some of uh, uh, important role players injury is of course is it's my is more difficult i think uh, for sure to to don't have uh, andy andreas world from the beginning of the season it's it's just a, a big handicap of course uh, we will try to to give all the all the confidence to our young goalkeepers, but uh, he's the number one of our team. And of course, especially in modern handball, it's so important the role of uh, of the goalkeeper, you know, maybe you are not playing your your best games or maybe your your best minutes, but if your goalkeeper is, uh, is on this level, he will always keep you, he will always keep the team. And for sure, this is maybe one of the reasons that is, uh, that we have more pro problems at this moment of course uh, now i don't i cannot help the team and uh, also paskovsky is uh, injury so we are playing some minutes with uh, right hander on the right back and this is a little bit difficult for our team who is who is knows not that used to to uh, to play this kind of handball and it's a little bit difficult But I think uh, we are competing all the games and uh, we we need uh, just some small details to co to correct. But uh, I hope that uh, the injury guys can come back as soon as possible. The, the guys will keep uh, fighting every game and uh, take as much uh, points as possible. And that's all. How's it and looking around Andy Wolf? Sorry? Uh, how's it looking around Andy Wolf? So what's his injury state saying right now? Ah, uh, he should. He, I think, uh, Monday, maybe Monday of uh, of the next week, uh, he have to make uh, some MRI also, some some test, and uh, after that we will know if uh, he can be back soon, or maybe it will take a little bit more time. And Alex, um, I I played with you, and I know you as a person. I know. Maybe you, you you don't show on the court as 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 other players how competitive are you, but I can see when when you are being 
beat it up. Uh, you like to go again against this per this this player, you know, that is trying to hit you and 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 to find him or something like that. And I don't remember Alex Dutsevayev being out for several games because I remember you had some shoulder problems in the Olympics or in this last season you have had some problems physically, but you never missed several games. Uh, or at least I don't remember. How is it for you to be out of the team and to see your team struggling? the way they mm. are uh, from from the from the stands really i hate that <laughs> for me <laughs> really the the worst thing of sport is is the injuries for sure for me after after is is lose is to lose the games but for sure it's like you know like like victor for sure when you are a part of the team you feel the team you feel the emotion of the teammates you you want to to help them to leave everything for them on the on the court on the field and when you are injured you can you try to to support uh, as much as you can but uh, it's not the same for sure and uh, this feeling when i see my teammates like fighting but uh, like uh, that I cannot help. I can. I always try to to help to to give some advice, maybe to to support them. But uh, f for me, it's difficult to be like out, to to just watch how they play, and uh, for sure in the bad moments because if they are winning, I I'm the first that that will keep here supporting, and and it's not problem for me. But especially in these moments that we are maybe not in our not winning that much uh, as we should do. Uh, then it's difficult. We are recording on Friday, so uh, you guys played yesterday against uh, Pick Sagat. Um And you were in the stadium, actually. Uh, did you uh, go into the dressing room in the halftime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go. So, actually, I'm super interested in seeing how your father, Talan <laughs> uh he mm -hmm. is... Uh, uh, he's coping with those situations because uh, you were down with one goal at halftime, I think. Um, and then you came out of that break and started off with a 6-2 run. Uh, what is talent telling the players uh, in, in those difficult situations? I, I, I just want to ask one th one thing uh, uh, to, to Alex about this halftime. Uh, did your father took his watch off? During the <laughs> halftime? <laughs> no, no, he did it. It was really... Maybe it was okay. It uh, was a moment, 15, uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes of the break. It's uh, it's a uh, long time okay. to talk, but uh, no, I think really he just uh, he just of course it was he was a little bit mad about uh, some kind of situation that we prepared that maybe especially yeah some details that we prepare and we don't do like that like it was supposed to do. But uh, he told us just that we were not playing at our level or not uh, in a good level that uh, our team was supposed to do, and we were just one down. And that was the, the main fact, I think. Uh, in first half, I think Shreget was better than us. We, we play bad. But also they were just uh, one goal up, it, and it's a small difference. When you start the second half, is completely different if you change the chip fast. I think this was uh, this was uh, an important moment after how we go out to on second half. I think it was very, very good. And after for me was the same was maybe the problem after that we have this moment, maybe I don't remember 15 or 10 minutes to the end that we have the change three or four attacks in a row to, to keep the difference on three, four goals. And we just keep, uh, we just stay on these two goals. That is a small difference at the end. That um, everything just two good defense, and they can they can be back on the game. And I think we cannot break this moment, uh, make this break on the game, to to make a, a bigger difference that will end the game. I think at that moment. I made I made this comment about the watch because I had I had I have not the chance to 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 have talent as a coach. But there is a story that says that when Talan is taking his watch off in the mean, in the half time, that's a really bad sign. <laughs> because then he he's going to hit something. Yeah, I see. 
It's Can some it's um, some hard times that it's better not be on the locker room, but uh, it's his role, I think. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Um, well, but maybe talking about difficult situations um, and with talent as well. I am sorry to have to bring that up, but uh, the 2022 final of the EHF Champions League, uh, it was a very intense uh, final against Barcelona. Um, 11 seconds on the clock, you guys were one down and then it was you taking the shot from the backcourt, but you knew that that free throw was coming in um, and in the last second you guys managed to equalize the game, uh, it went to extra time, uh, in the extra time you took the last shot again, it just went wide, it was a difficult shot, but then uh, in the in the penalties, it went to penalties, uh, it was only you who uh, missed that penalty to, uh, well, uh, Yeah, give Barca the the Champions League victory. Was that the toughest loss of your career? Mm. Mm. Maybe, yeah, yeah. No, one of them is difficult to now. It was some some games that hurt me a lot, but maybe at this moment was was uh, for me was so difficult moment to manage because of course. It was a difficult year. We were in the final like uh, no one expect us at uh, this moment because last year we keep strong from the whole season and really we were there and uh, we deserve to be there like uh, earlier. We I I know at this moment at this point that we will be in the final four and uh, that we we will have the chance to win. But this season before we were so strong on the season, but. Uh, Of course, when you go to the final four, it's uh, it's different because it doesn't matter what uh, what you do before. It's just the final four, and uh, I have some some moments that uh, I think uh, we were prepared to win. But uh, you know, this is just some small details, and uh, maybe this moment that uh, me, like a captain, like I have the the responsibility to to miss this penalty. It was really it was difficult moment for me because uh, of course i know that uh, is like is like victor say now i have the compromise with you but <laughs> but to win this season but it was a compromise like for uh, guys that make really an amazing work that put his uh, his own self into a big pressure that we really were so prepared to win and uh, i think that the team was at this moment in a very very high level and uh, Everyone really, if you look how we prepared this final four and all the the stuff that was around, we were mentally so ready to to win it. And uh, after to to miss this penalty and don't manage to to win this final, and of course penalties like really we we qualize the game, but of course penalty shootouts is like Russian roulette. It's difficult to to know who will win, and it doesn't mean that the other team was better than you. It's just Someone have to win. And I don't I, want to be understood wrong say. here uh, because uh, it does take some guts to uh, be stepping up and uh, be taking the penalty in the uh, in the Champions League final. Um, and Paris de Vargas pulled out a massive save against you. So uh, one has to say that uh, it was a, a gigantic save from uh, Gonzalo Perez de Vargas and it could have happened to anyone. So uh, I, I want just, to make a comment uh, about that because... Uh, I, I I had the chance to also throw one penalty in that scenario against Flensburg in, the, in that semifinal that we lost against them. And I have never felt so much pressure in my life because from the moment you know it's your turn until you throw the ball, it's million things going through your mind. So when I when I approached to the ball, I took the ball. It was a lot of glue on the ball. Then I thought about my family. I thought about my wife. I thought about my teammates. Oh, I thought about how many penalties I shot against Matthias Anderson. Did I shot any penalties against Matthias Anderson? Where, where did I shoot the last penalty? Does he know? Does he doesn't know? So it's million things going through your mind and you, you, you can feel it's 20,000 people staring at you, you know? So, It's a lot of pressure, and as you said, it takes a lot of balls to to shoot a penalty in in a final four. Most definitely, and uh, I do have huge respect uh, for you in that situation as well. Um, 
actually, what goes through your mind when you're stepping up to a penalty in a high pressure situation? No, really, like you said, like Victor said, it's, uh, it's really, I try to, yes, of course, like everyone to, to what can I, what can I do? How I, I should have to react, but really it's a million things because of course, like Victor say, I, I take, uh, for example, against Gonzalo, it was at this moment that I take a lot of uh, shoots against him on the, in some games, but also in a lot of trainings, I know where I can score where usually I can score more or or less, but it's it's difficult because at this moment really it's a million things in your head. It's of course the pressure that uh, you know, and especially at that moment because you know when when someone missed before, it's easier because now, like you have the advantage. But at this moment, it's like if you miss, it's your fault. It's like uh, maybe the other team have the chance to win, and uh, really it's it was difficult because. Uh, I was like thinking like uh, I will shoot in another way that I shoot at this moment, <laughs> but at this moment is just the things happen so fast and that's all. I think uh, uh, really it's difficult, like Victor say, and it takes uh, a lot of uh, balls. But uh, I know how uh, I know that uh, is the pressure that uh, that I should take, and that's all. If uh, I will get again some penalty at the, at that point, I hope we win before. But if if I should take it, I will try to to take it again for sure. To try to relax more or to to take off more things of the head. But like Victor says, it's difficult when when it's a lot of people <laughs> watching you at this moment. You know the pressure is more. Of course, about the family, but about your team is to don't like. It's like uh, who say this that uh, if you take uh, one shot and you think about what will happen when you miss, you will miss it. And then, uh, but it's difficult to at this moment to don't think about that you can miss and uh, what will happen. And for sure, I will just try to relax my mind and to see what happened. And after that final, <laughs> you did post something on social media uh, apologizing but uh, you did receive a lot of love under under that post uh, especially from those Kielce fans um, and that might just bring us over how important is handball for the people of Kielce maybe even compared to all your other st other stations uh, that you played as in a pro uh, as a pro player really it's Mm, they are amazing fans for me really maybe are the best fans in the world for sure everyone who can say this about the 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 fans of his club but really they are they are fantastic the Kelsey is a it's a city that uh, that love humble and that especially live from humble it's like uh, you can feel it when when you go around and Uh, some some people just just to to give you the hand to say hey great game just like that it's not uh, they don't even need to to take you a picture or to ask you about something it's just hey let's go guys we support you uh, let's win the next game let's uh, let's be there and they are really all the city are um, are so involved in the in the humble team and really love humble and you can see every time we will we play against some important game uh, to qualify for final four even how how many fans uh, go to the final four to support us every year and uh, also also to when you see in another arenas that we play uh, how much they love humble and they can make three three thousand kilometers and i don't know how much to to just watch uh, one humble game and to come back I hope I hope I'm not uh, putting you in any trouble with this question. But now that you spoke about the the city and the fans and and everything, what's the 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 situation of the club now after all the changes that has been in the management? Now that Bertus is not there anymore as a as a how to say a president, uh, uh, what's the what's the situation of the of the club? Uh, are are we? going to be able to see Kielce for a long, long time uh, competing for winning the Champions League? I hope, I hope really. Uh, they really, at the moment, they just take the talk the, the club for one month, one month and half, and they are trying to to put 
all the things to take all the things uh, with patience but uh, they told us that uh, really it, uh, this change doesn't mean that uh, it will be big changes they will try to continue on that way that was with Bertus just to that uh, we can just think about humble that the the team will be still competitive that uh, the club will manage to pay to pay us all the salaries that we will, will have quiet in this because uh, maybe the last years was most about people talk more more about kills of course on on the pitch but also outside about uh, about our problems and uh, about our financial problems and i hope with this new new sponsor it will be finished with these new owners of the club and uh, i hope everything will be fine but of course uh, i think this just uh, just uh, we will see after some time we all we all hope that uh, kielce will stay on the top of the competition for many years um we also spoke in some of the episodes before that some of the big players you know uh, they show character when the games have to decide and as bang asked you about you took the shot also the penalty and you also said if you had the chance to do it again you would do it and that's also to me shows you know, some of the big players that are ready to take this experience because sometimes it can be a split second that you can be the hero or you can be the bad guy and um but to me when i look at you playing alex is also like also in the national team that whenever the game has to be decided or um, yeah you're one man up you like to be in these kind of crunch situations i call them when the games can be decided is that correct or wrong did you is that something you got put on by the coach or is it you feel comfortable in you know having the ball in your own hands then for example someone else is going to have the ball in their hands no really i think it's it's about just about the confidence i think uh, at this moment yeah. i i i think i have the confidence of my teammates of the coaches of all the staff i have this also this responsibility but i think it's if i don't feel this confidence of my teammates uh, or yeah, not just in Kelsey, also uh, like you say national team or something like that maybe i i will try another thing but if i feel the confidence that that I can take this shoot, uh, I will. I will take. Of course, it's not about just the shoot. It's also try to create some good situation. Uh, not always you can choose the the best option, the best solution. But uh, I I know that in this moment when it's difficult, when you you have to you need to to be there. Uh, I always try to be there. I I know the team. The team need me. And I will try my best to to just help to the team to win. Maybe coming a little bit over to uh, your family because uh, we were talking about big names uh, in Kielce, but the name Dushabayev, uh, it's almost like a legacy in uh, Kielce's history. But uh, for you growing up as the son of one of the best handball players ever, was it a curse or was it a blessing uh, to be uh, to be carrying the name growing up uh, Dusha Bayev? No, for me, I I always answer that uh, the same because I think at some point, especially at the beginning when you are young, it was like, oof, it was difficult because of the fact that uh, uh, everyone get you a big pressure and uh, for sure when you are a, a kid a child you are not that used to uh, have haters or or to receive some hate and it's difficult to to manage with this but i think it's uh, really it's um, is the life that i don't how to explain i don't know uh, another way i i know how it was and uh, i know that if you play good people will talk more because uh, uh, you make good thing and of course everyone will say oh we'll make more hype on you but also the same on the opposite way if you play bad everyone will say ah he's uh, he's bad he will play because of his father or uh, some things like that but it's um, it's the life it was uh, it was maybe some no it was not some problem but it was a little bit more difficult to manage maybe when you are when you are a teenager when you are at that moment that you that you are supposed supposed to do uh, 
mm, your evolution like a player maybe that after when after i think when i became like professional player I, you don't care that much about that and it's a little bit different but uh, of course uh, when you are still young at a, at some point when you are still a kid it's a little bit more difficult to manage this but when uh, you uh, daniel and talon sit by the dinner table what do you guys talk about <laughs> no <laughs> about my son about the kids <laughs> do you, do you, do you, do you make him. jokes do you make jokes about the the coach or something like that <laughs> uh, uh, we make some jokes but no but, but i would like I, would, Campbell, I, I, I actually would like to know <laughs> if you make jokes to your father about something he has done in the training is he taking them in a good ah, mood or is he getting okay mad? maybe if it's something some exceptional but not not so much really, really <laughs> as much as of course we talk about we talk about campbell but really we try to to don't mix too much of course campbell is part of our lives and is a, a yeah. big part of our lives but uh, we really try to focus in on other things it's a uh, and especially now uh, now with my sons of course he's like a grandfather and uh, he 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 like to to be with them a lot a lot but uh, really i uh, we try to just to talk uh, about other things then, then i would like to ask who's the worst loser in your family The worst loser. Uh, do you mean in table games or in what? In... Yeah, just in general. That's. I in think life. I know the answer, but I want to hear you. <laughs> oh, really? We are okay. We, you know, we are competing. We are competitive, <laughs> but uh, we know that that is like low competition. We, for example. <laughs> My father, maybe if he compete against me or against Danny, will be more like a serious competition. He will not leave you. But if uh, if it with uh, with my kids, he always give. He will give all for them, and he will not care. It will be not even funny. Uh, he will just give him all. You win, and that's all. I can imagine being a bad winner as well when you win against your father or your brother in some games, because it's not only about being a bad loser. <laughs> uh, no, I don't like too much to trust of them after. No, I'm, I'm not that. I'm not that kind of guy. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but maybe talking about uh, your family, talking about your last name, did you have any choice growing up, or was it always clear that you have to become a handball player? No, like uh, like Victor. No, I was so good uh, football player before, but uh, <laughs> sometimes it's not. <laughs> Oh, bye bye no, guys. No. I have to leave. I have to leave this this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> no, no, really. It was more they never pushed me like uh, like to play handball like uh, you are supposed to play or you have to play, you need to do it, but it was just like I think a normal a normal process when when your father play and you go to every single game to every single match, uh, you stay after the games to play with him with the ball a little bit. And after when you grow, really, I start to play in Ciudad Real when uh, he was playing there. And uh, it was just because my friends, uh, most of my friends play, play more handball. I play both. I play football and handball a little bit, but when I have like 10 years old and uh, it was just uh, all the guys of uh, of my school called me like please you have to play you have to play uh, it will be funny and uh, it was more because i want to go to spend more time with my friends that uh, that because someone told me like you you have to play how much handball did you play together with your brother when you were kids oh like a lot <laughs> <laughs> like like but more on the you know the we just uh, take this for example we play uh, we play basketball uh, handball the width of these small balls and we crush everything at home my father was at some point was not so happy but uh no like uh, we say it was it was five years difference but really danny was since he was really a small kid he was so big for his age and uh, 
we always like to to play one one with other and uh, we play a lot like at home and uh, after of course uh, it becomes something more serious and uh, we play yeah, we now we just train we don't make that stuff but of course when we were kids a lot actually when was that point when when he became taller than you Oof, it was not uh, maybe with i remember this my last year from high school i got like 17 years old and i remember i have this scene like uh, in my mind that, that i meet with him that he was and he was at this point 12 years old and he come okay he was not taller than me but he was taller than all my all my friends and i remember <laughs> i think at that moment okay he's five years younger than them all and he's almost that guy like them and uh, I, and at that moment i say okay he will be for sure taller than me <laughs> i i know the feeling that a five year younger person is taller <laughs> than you you know i know i know the feeling <laughs> only five Victor. only five <laughs> well let's say five just it's a random number <laughs> yeah well fair enough Although, fair enough otherwise you would have been a great right back victor if you had just 10 centimeters more right i would have been the best <laughs> 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 no oh i i always uh i always um said to my good friend laszlo Nach, oh my god i hoped god just gives me your body you know because <laughs> the, the 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 life is so unfair sometimes he is uh, two meters uh, a lot of centimeters and i am just a normal guy <laughs> <laughs> enough of your uh, your history let's uh, have a little look into the future 2024 starts off with a banger uh, the ehf euros in germany are coming what are your expectations for that tournament really I think uh, we have to we have to prepare good because uh, we are uh, in a tough group and after the, if we qualify to the main round it will be difficult that we have uh, we will have to win a lot of teams if we want to be on the semi-final then we have just to focus on the first game against Croatia that will be really it will give us a lot of information about uh, how will how easy or difficult uh, can be after the things for us because i think uh, if you start good if you start on the on the good way we can we can maybe be able to to reach the semi-finals again but if, if you almost lose this game you will you will not have this bonus track uh, in all in all the the tournament and then it will be a difficult situation and to, uh, we will have to be ready to to manage this all right, we will keep our fingers crossed for you uh, on one hand that you will be back at 100% until then um, and uh, on the other hand that all your ambitions with the Spanish national team will become true as well as with Kielce. And I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for your time, for the insights and for getting to know Alex Dushibayev a little more, a little better. Um, and it is a great guy that we have been talking to for the last uh, 45 minutes. Um, and yeah, I wish you the best of luck for the rest of your season. Thank you very much. I hope you too. I will keep following the program and for sure will be nice. Sweet. Then uh, we will catch you around. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah, tough group for, for Spain and the Spanish national team. Maybe let's just uh, keep it up from that point. Uh, Victor, uh, how do you see Spain's chances Oof, in the Euros? Uh, you have to remind me which teams is uh, which national teams Spain is going to play against because it's, I don't remember now. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Romania, it's Austria and Croatia in, in the yeah. group. Um, but yeah, yeah, what do you think? Uh, how's, uh, how's their chances? Yeah, I think Spain is no doubt the, the favorite in, in the group. But as Alex said, the first game of the championship, it's always, uh, it's always dangerous. It's always difficult. It's a lot of things uh, at stake. And, and you know that this first game can be so important for the future of the championship. And also it's the, the first contact with the championship. You know, all the players have been practicing for 20 days uh, 
uh, and they just want to compete. So um, I think Spain is the clear number one of, of the group and one of the favorites for the for the tournament. Uh, but in handball, you never know. You We have seen crazy things, especially in the Final Fours and in the big championships. So, uh, of course, I, I wish the best for, for Spain. Martin, it looked like you wanted to say something. Uh, to right? No, no, no. The only thing that I know for sure is that when we look at the history, it's going to be uh, Sweden, Denmark, Spain and France in the semifinals. That's what the history <laughs> says. So. And, oh, uh, and you uh, you rule uh, Germany out as the hosts of that tournament? Germany, they're good and they're going to, you know, they're going to do really, really great. Um, also on home field and whenever we've seen a championship where the home town is playing, uh, oh, yeah, the home country is playing, um, then obviously it's going to give them a boost. But I'm just, to me personally, um, the national team of Sweden, Denmark, Spain and France are better when I look at it at the moment now, and I, when also when I look at the top teams in Germany, I primarily see um, the best players in those clubs that are from other countries than Germany. That's not saying that Germany don't have a great national team. They really have. And to me, the strength in the German national team is that they are probably not relying on one or two players. They're more like a team and they have great players in every position. But yeah, as I said, when I look at the best teams in the world, then it seems like, yeah, they have Andy Wolf. Uh, uh, I would consider as one of the best goalkeepers in the world than some of the Lion players. But besides that, uh, Jori Knorr is, is really, really great. But uh, I, I see the other teams, uh, national teams being stronger. But uh, yeah, let's see. Well, but especially that hype that you've been talking about uh, in a home country, it uh, will absolutely mm -hmm. boost Germany uh, because uh, I'm recording from Düsseldorf right now and uh, in Düsseldorf there will be that opening match. World record opening match. Can we talk about that for a second <laughs> once again? 50,000 people watching a handball game uh, in the arena. That will be just insane. That will be so intense and I'm so much looking forward to that day and to, uh, to that match, uh, especially against Switzerland land it will be um and yeah germany just uh, looks fired up for uh, that home uh, championship already especially because uh, it will be a year of home championships for germany uh, in the summer there will be the football euros coming to germany uh, as well and uh, just when you see how uh, the the marketing tools are running in germany for that tournament uh, it's just intense to see and it's just great uh, there is a joint marketing tool uh, rolling through all of germany uh, joined by handball and football um and uh, you just love to see it and uh, i do feel like uh, with the best squad on the pitch germany will always play a role um and when andy wolf comes back and he comes back to full strength uh, he might be one of the x factors um and my hot take right now germany will go through to the semis but you, you, you have mm. to explain me something that I have never understood, Bank, uh, uh, because in the previous years, now now Germany is going to play in Germany, so in a, in a hometown. Uh, so I assume that a lot of players like, I don't know, uh, Peckler, for example, or uh, yeah, Fabian Bide is injured. Uh, so, some important names we have injured, seen. Yeah. We have seen through the last years that they say no to the national team. They They... They don't go to the national team when the coach is calling them. What is happening in the last years with these uh, players? Because it's something I, 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 I really have a hard time to understand. Me too. I, I can't understand that too much either. But uh, the Germans are playing in the toughest league in the world. You uh, got to admit that. And you got to see that uh, go into your full strength each and every weekend. And then uh, playing in the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League uh, within the week, uh, it does get tough and the the time schedule doesn't get any uh, any less tight for for the players but still i do feel like uh, the home championship will motivate them to come back and you got to trust the process as well uh, since alfred gislason is there uh, as a coach the curve has been going up for germany and uh, i do feel like uh, that might continue and that might motivate some players to come back once again but uh, i do agree with you 
it is a huge honor to play for your country and to represent your country. Um, and it's, it is a little difficult to understand why uh, some players uh, say, no, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, it's, I, it's, sorry, Martin. I, I, I understand yeah. that it's the toughest league by far. By far, there is no discussion. Uh, it's, it's, it's Germany and then it's France, but of course, Bundesliga is the toughest league. Okay, we agree on that. But still... When the big championships are coming, it's it's the 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 the, the place the, it's a playground where you want to be playing as a player. So uh, uh, it doesn't matter how tough it is your league or how tired you you, you are. You go to, to to the world championship or to the European championship when your national coach uh, is 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 calling you. So it's something. It's something uh, very, very. Uh, it's traveling me for so long time because I can't understand it. I I agree because national team has to be. If you know playing for your club team is one thing, but to me, the highest thing you can achieve as a player should be the national team and um, yeah, that honor to represent your country and also yeah, as being said, I probably some of them will be there when they can play in front of that many thousand, fifty thousand, and it's gonna be insane. Having in mind also the culture when it comes to. German spectators, they know how to make noise, but I don't know if it started when I remember once uh, Uwe Gensheimer Gensheim made a campaign, uh, don't play the players or something like that. I'm not, I don't even if, uh, know if I'm allowed to say here, but you know, it was about playing too many games and uh, not having the time to rest and going from one game to another. But yeah, as Victor said, it's, um, hmm. It's the biggest championships you want to be there, and especially when it comes on the home field as well. Uh, hopefully, we see them when it comes to this 2024 because we want the best players there. Because the thing is that uh, there is many, many Scandinavian players that plays in the Bundesliga, and we don't True. see yeah. Scandinavian players saying no to their national team. So something is happening with the uh, with a good uh, point. Germany That's a good point. national team. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we do yeah. hope that we will see the best of the best competing in oh, a little less than, oh, no, I got to do my math, three months, a little less than three months uh, in the beginning of January. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. But we do see the best of the best competing each and every week, week in and week out in the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League. Uh, and so it was uh, this week for us, last week for you guys, when you listen to that podcast. And uh, well, we had him as a guest. So why not just uh, start with Kjelse and that very tight match against uh, Seged. What was up? Why didn't Kjelse manage to take home that victory? Well, to me, it's... Yeah, we spoke about it with Alex, you know, uh, he uh, maybe didn't want to say it because it's uh, it's about him. But, you know, once is that you're taking Andy Wolf out and then when Alex is going out, it's not only, a, you know, a high quality player that you're, you're taking out. It's also that some of the teammates, they will look at Alex whenever the game is going to be decided. Sometimes Alex is just going to take the ball into his own hands and he's going to go one versus one against some player who tried to beat him up, as Victor said. And, you know, having that kind of character on the field, someone else has got to take on that responsibility. And who is just going to take on that from one week to another? You know, they miss out, I would say, 10 shots per game with Alex. They miss out, I don't know may, how many assists. And also, Alex, I think he's really good with playing the to, with the line player in general. So, I don't know. It's a tough love in general for Kelch. And we spoke about it earlier, having not, to me, the two biggest stars. And Alex also said they don't really know how to play with a right-handed right back. Um, so, I don't know. One thing is, is it the level that we can expect from Kelcher at the moment? Or is, yeah, are the other teams overperforming? I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. In my opinion, the thing is that when, when a team like Kelce has been playing with uh, Alex uh, in the last uh, four or five seasons, and, and that player has taken all the important moments of the games, and and, and the attack game is going around him. Uh, yeah. when, when you don't have him, it's difficult to adapt. It's difficult to find new ways to, 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 to take the shots and to find good uh, positions to, to shoot. And uh, it's difficult to adapt. And I think they are doing a, a good job 
But of course, this is a very competitive competition. And as you said, the, the, the group that Kielce is in is, uh, is, is really hard. It's really hard. And then there is another factor. It's the, the goalkeepers. I think Balag, he was not bad. Uh, uh, but but we have seen in the game uh, Kiel Kiel said two weeks ago, it was uh, the the goalkeepers were not uh, delivering. So when yeah. Balak, I think he had uh, nine saves yesterday, mm-hmm. and I think yeah. and I think that uh, in 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 Seged they had eleven. This small yeah. uh, gap between them, it's what it's making you win or or, or don't win the game. Yeah, especially uh, in that group. Uh, it is super tight. I have not expected that group to be uh, that tight. Paris and Kyo uh, going away with four victories out of that five uh, out of the first five matches. And after that, you have uh, Kolstad on three, Zagreb uh, on four, Alborg on five, and uh, Kielce on six. Three of those four teams with five points, one team with six points. Um, it is just uh, super intense, and especially with that Kyo loss, I want to open up the race for uh, the second spot once again. Yeah, it's interesting because everyone is beating everyone. It's only Barcelona who's not losing at the moment, and especially in Group A. But I was also thinking who's not going to make it through, you know, from the group because we have Sacred with five points. Pick Seconds is at the moment in the spot who's not going through. But uh, I think the most of us would have predicted Pick Seconds to go through. And Sacred is a kind of a story. Also last year, it looked like they would go through for the first time in many, many years. And then Porto made a comeback and then took the spot instead of them. Um, uh, in general, uh, I like that everyone is beating everyone. And we, we we cannot just sit here and say, yeah, it's for sure. Paris and Kiel are going to win these kind of matches. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, to predict it, but I would still say that Pik Seged are going through and that Sakrev is probably going to be the dark horse. Oh, your decisive week uh, is just coming up because uh, Seged and Zagreb are facing each other this Tuesday, yeah. uh, this Thursday. Um, it uh, will be super intense. Victor, would you agree that that match might decide who is going through? The way, the way, the way it has been the group uh, i wouldn't say that for one match uh, one team is going to get the spot or or the other don't uh, i would say it's still a lot of games to be played but in my opinion pig seget has a, a a better squad than than zagreb but they haven't shown it so far so uh, yes it was a good point uh, last night in, in, in Poland but I think that Seged is in this uh, difficult uh, situation now that, because they know that uh, Appelgren is coming next season and, and and they will have a new coach I don't know, I think if I would have to say something I would say as well that Seged is going through but uh, I don't want to bet on it Yeah, but I, I have to also give that. a a little bit of a shout out to a guy who's actually delivering week in and week out. Uh, it's Timia Dibirov. Uh, I, I I I like him, you know, the left wing, and it seems like he can just go from the tiniest spot from the left wing. And he's 40 years old, and he's I think he's the top scorer in the Champions League for soccer. I'm not 100% sure, but I just wanted to give a. I, I think it's impressive how he keeps performing at the highest level. Um, but another thing I was also looking at is that last year we had Wiesler Plotsch, who um, they they won against Nantes in 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 penalties, and they actually made a great effort against Magdeburg, who ended up winning it. At the moment, they played five games and they lost all five games. I know, uh, if I remember correctly, they will play against Celia next time, who's also lost every game they have, um, but been. L- Actually, looking pretty okay from what I expected from Celia, but Wiesler Plotz, last year quarterfinals uh, finalist, also with zero points after five. That's to me a surprise so far in the season. I uh, just want to confirm you that Timo Dibrov uh, is the the top scorer for uh, Zagreb at the moment, having scored 23 goals and a shot efficiency of uh, 74%. That is something. Um, yeah. But uh, it is not the 100% that uh, Ludovic Fabregas kept up in the first games. But last week he, he broke. Last week he uh, 
did uh, have his first <laughs> throw. Uh, yeah, well, that didn't go in. And this week, he just went one out of three. Is Ludovic Fabregas finished? Is he washed? <laughs> <laughs> Probably his son was uh, crying too loud uh, last night, and then that's why he <laughs> he missed a couple of shots. Or this is uh, showing us that he's not a robot. He's not a... Uh, yeah, uh, this, a Decepticon, you know. Or, <laughs> he's humaning a little bit. Oh, he's human, you know. I, 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 yeah. I used to call him a transformer because uh, <laughs> he, he, he looked like a robot. You know, he never changed his uh, his face. He, you, you cannot see if he's feeling something or not. You know, yeah. so he can score I, I ten call... goals and still have the same face expression. <laughs> yes, I call him Optimus Prime. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Optimus I, 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 Prime I think, of the Machine think, CKEHF Champions yeah, League, man. I, I love think it. he liked it. I think he liked it, but I didn't know because he never smiled to me when I called him uh, Optimus Prime. So <laughs> I'm not sure if he liked it or not. Yeah, but um, it's one thing is speaking about how good Fabregas is doing it. Uh, you know, we spoke a lot about Barcelona with Sindrich leaving the club, Margot's an injury. Actually, I don't think people have been spoken that much about the Lime player position in Barcelona like they lost to me the best player in the world and and it's like okay we will talk about the playmaker position Sender Itch Margoc but it seems like they're coping with losing uh, Fabregas pretty good in Barcelona you know it better than me Victor but uh, it's like it seems like of course it's a topic but you know they still have Luis Frade who's a great player but they brought in two younger ones and we spoke about it earlier but it, it's more a topic that the playmaker than the actually losing the best player in the world on the line player position. It's true, but um, I, I think they are coping really, really well with uh, with this uh, when when Ludo is is leaving the club, you know, because Luis Frade is doing a great job, especially yeah. in my opinion in in attack. He is also defending in number two, which is good but i think that in attack so far uh, the team is not missing uh, ludovic fabregas uh, i think that javi rodriguez is is doing a great job but he still needs time to to adapt to the team yeah. and to the level of pressure you know because in barcelona yeah. you have to give always 100 percent and jaime gallego also needs to some more time to adapt because he was injured last season. Uh, he turned his uh, ACL, and, and you can see that he is uh, still not on the on the rhythm. And you said it also with the THV Kiel jersey that whenever you put that on, it's going to be a different pressure. We spoke about with Skibaga to last week. The same pressure is in Barcelona, who's yeah on the men's side probably the biggest club in the world. So uh, it's not just you know putting it on, going in, doing what you normally do. There will be expectation and there will be eyes on you, and people will expect you to deliver week in and week out. It is one thing to lose one of your best players. It is the other thing to have that guy coming back. But as an opponent, um, and talking about Tiavi Kiel. That is a very, very good topic because uh, Zander Zagosen, if Kiel didn't miss him yet, they are most definitely after that game. Yeah, I saw yeah. some highlights for the game. Uh, he looked on fire. Like you could see it also what it meant to him when he was scoring goals and it's like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he was doing the in flight. They probably knew it coming, but still, yeah, eight goals, playing a great game. And, but, as we, we have said it many times, I expect also, especially in the in Norway, if Sanda wasn't on fire in this one, then I don't know which game he would be in fire, on fire in. Yes, for, for a Scandinavian player, Sanda is a player that is, is showing some, some emotions uh, sometimes, which yeah. I like. And, <laughs> uh, and, and, and we could see yesterday that he was uh, highly, highly motivated. Um, especially in, in Norway against Kiel. Uh, of course, he's a key player for his team, but in my opinion, the best he did yesterday, it was his accuracy. It was eight goals out of nine. Yeah. Uh, sometimes five five you see... First half. Yeah, sometimes you see Sander taking a lot of responsibility. So he is the player who has to take uh, all the risk. And sometimes he is... 
uh, doing too many mistakes because he is the one who has yeah. to make it. So the, the the best, in my opinion, yesterday was his uh, his accuracy and his control of uh, mistakes. Yeah, and on the other hand, uh, Kio, they didn't find their way uh, through against Kolstad. Um, they were behind all the time, so uh, they didn't lead uh, one single time. Um, and last week we uh, did talk big words about uh, Skipper Goethe, um, but this week you just have to have to double check, especially after that Sander Zagosen performance on the center back position. Did Kio sacrifice uh, one year for the future? What do you mean? So I don't Sanders really Sanders understand. Uh, yeah. I, I understand that they, whenever they brought in Elias, they thought, okay, we will give him a year. He's not a guy who's going to perform now. He's going to perform in one year. Uh, yeah, the, uh, that direction. So uh, that you yeah. use one year of development, uh, especially on that center back position, because uh, with Sander Zagosen, you lost a world class player. Well, yeah, Sander also made six assists yesterday. So, you know, looking at that game, you can say that it probably looked like that. But to me also, when I look at the stats, I know Erik Johansson also only made one goal in three attempts. But when I, if I was capable of shooting as good as Erik Johansson, I would shoot more than three times in a game. <laughs> I would also expect Billig to be there because, you know, the confidence that Billig plays in with the national team when he plays for Austria, uh, I wouldn't say it's a He's different, but you know, he's just the guy, the go to guy for the Austria team. And he scored four goals, seven attempts. I think Dumagoy Dunyak also has a role to play there. And they also lost Sarabic Kiel. So you cannot blame Elias for not being there. But yeah, someone else has to step in. I think we mentioned in the last episode also, it's Elias and you have to give him, you know, the time. Um, of course, you can expectations, but. Um, he's pr you're probably not going to win the Champions League with him as a playmaker at the moment. But maybe in a years to come, he will be one there and he's shown what he's capable of. But I would look at Erik Johansson and Billig and expect more of the, those kind of players in these games. Opinions on that, Victor? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that you cannot put uh, all the weight uh, over Elias uh, as Kipavo to shoulders because... He's too young, as we said. He has a big character. He has a big talent. But still, uh, what I just said about Sander Sagos, and I think this is something that he still struggles with, uh, about mistakes, you know, about giving uh, uh, the ball, every ball, every every mistake yeah. is important in the game, in this kind of games. So he, I think he's still young and he needs more time, especially in a very, very heavy jersey uh, 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 like Kiel yeah. uh, because uh, that's uh, I said Barcelona and Kiel jerseys are wonderful, are beautiful but when you wear them up uh, in a playing court and you're playing with that team, that's very heavy you know, it's very heavy to, to wear so uh, yes, I think that uh, Billy can, and Johansson uh, they have to step up uh, a, a little bit and of course uh, the goalkeepers uh, yesterday, actually, they had one more save than than Kolstad goalkeepers. But for Kiel, or for what they are used to, it's it's not enough. And they also had more shots towards goals, uh, I think. But I agree with you, Victor. Um, it's a topic with Elias. But let's have a look at it. You said Erik Johansson, national player from Sweden. You have uh, Billig, who's a star player from Austria. You have Karl Valisnius if I say it correctly, from Sweden, national player, Gobindo, Hal Reinkin, um, Dumagoy Dunyak, and then you have Elias in my world. So, um, you know, they have plenty of quality players. Um, it shouldn't be a, a, a topic because I, I don't know if he's injured or not, but Carl Valilius, he had one shot in the game and he didn't score. And yeah, they should uh, be capable of doing more. But yeah, once again, they played in Norway against the... Uh, top motivated Costa team and also we have to look at it they were not struggling in the Champions League but Kiel at the moment uh, they're not delivering what we were expecting in the Bundesliga and maybe that's a small small part also of the of the story here that they don't have the same confidence as a Kiel team normally would have yeah, the heavy times uh, might just arrive uh, in the machine secret uh, Jeff Champions League right now because, can, uh, can you guys uh, yeah 
can you guys imagine a EHF Champions League last uh, next season without Kill on it? Absolutely not. No, 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 no. it's insane, you know. Me neither. It's insane. So, yeah. But yeah. I mean, the season is still long enough, right? Uh, we have uh, eight, nine games played or something in that direction. Um, and especially in the Bundesliga, the teams are always taking the points away from each other. So uh, it just needs uh, one long streak for Kiel to, to bounce back on that. But it's definitely not booked yet. Uh, so uh, they got to bounce back. They got to keep fighting and they got to, well, twist the table uh, or turn the table around. Because uh, as it looks right now, I don't see them qualifying over the league uh, already, but uh, we will see where mm -hmm. where that goes and how that one will end up. And uh, Martin, as you said, they uh, do have many quality players and they uh, have many games to prove their quality uh, next week against uh, PSG, against Paris Saint-Germain. Um, yeah. That will be a super tight match, uh, last year's quarterfinal. The, the classic... Um quarterfinal in the uh, machine Chiri ESF Champions League. <laughs> they get to meet every every year in the quarterfinals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, another match that I'm going to be looking at is uh, Alborg against Kolstad, the Scandinavian Derby. Are we allowed to call it like that? Why not? I think we are. <laughs> yeah, we think, but I also will be looking at Barcelona against Vesprem. Uh, but yeah, Olbo against Kolstad is definitely a uh, one to watch. Uh, I think the effort Kolstad have made is, um, you know, trying to take the throne from Olbo as the best team in Scandinavia. Uh, let's see if they're capable of it. I don't think so, but uh, it's great with some uh, competition. And um, there are definitely great, great players on the Kolstad team with Joran. Johannesson, uh, Sigvaldi on the right wing, Torben Bergaro. Yeah, I, I don't need to mention them. People know who they are. And it's it's an interesting match. But also, uh, I cannot keep stop looking at Barcelona against Vespino. <laughs> uh, Victor, who do you see ahead in that uh, in that duel? barcelona Vesprem or... Yeah, barcelona uh, barcelona Vesprem. That's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. I think I think that if if there is one team who can beat Barcelona in Barcelona is best yeah. friend this season. Uh but still I think Barcelona is the favorite because they have shown everybody uh at what level they are playing. They 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 have showed a lot of uh, uh, great things uh, as we said before coping with this uh, Ludovic Fabregas going to to Vesprem. And and I think they have played amazing games uh, in 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 Montpellier, for example, uh, in Porto against Gheorghe. So I think that still uh, Barcelona is the the favorite. Yeah, they uh, probably are the favorite, but we are looking at uh, title favorites against uh, title favorites. That's probably uh, what we can. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, what we can write sure. about this uh, this match. Um, but then on the other hand, women's Champions League, the EHF Champions League women is back as well. Um, once that we uh, are published, you guys know a little more than we do because, uh, as we said already, we're recording on Friday and the publish is planned for. Monday um, but yeah we will see how Vipers uh, are, are looking because uh, it was uh, not the start that they dreamed of not the start that they're used to and now they are facing with the Krim one of those teams to watch this season um, and for you guys the upcoming weekend uh, it's against uh, Mets I think uh, so the the upcoming weekend they are playing against Mets two tight weeks for, for Vipers Christians and Yes, I think that the, the defeat at home against Esbjerg in the last uh, uh, moment of the game, that was very tough because uh, I think they didn't deserve to, to lose like that. Uh, so this game in, in Ljubljana is, uh, is important for them. It's important. Uh, but I think that Vipers is, is, is Vipers. They still have a lot of good players and, and we cannot count uh, Vipers out even if they lose uh, against against cream outside and then we will see how how this uh, Mets game is is going in Norway yeah totally uh we are looking forward to it and i think well martin you would probably agree that you can uh, never count vipers out of the uh, out of the uh, 
uh, out of the tournament, uh, especially uh, now that we are just uh, four weeks into the tournament. I don't know how uh, about you guys, but it feels like an eternity that uh, we played EHF Champions League women. Uh, it's it's it feels like a little bit of a while, but I'm actually um, I'm, 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 yeah, ECAS won with one goal in the last minute uh, with uh, what did we call it, Maquera Raqueta. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's the that's the name that uh, during, she gave herself as well. The, yeah, Victor to, uh, called her the bomb up. machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the bomb machine. So I'm excited to see Krim playing at home against a, a quality team like Vipers. If they can keep it up, um, what they did the week before, or not the week before, but last time against Ecast, and I'm also a little bit excited uh, for FTC um, after. The coach left. Um, they're gonna play a tough, tough game in Denmark against Esbjerg. Uh, how do they look? I expect Esbjerg to win. But one thing is that whenever you lose a game, they've been losing with a lot of goals. I, I'm, I'm gonna be excited to see the expression from the players. How do they look? Uh, do they fight differently? Yeah, um, because uh, if they wanna, you know, be in the in the last. Uh, best teams then they have to I wouldn't say in this game but they have to step up also having in mind they only brought against Ra Rapid Bucharest at home yeah absolutely it will be super interesting to see and uh, I am keen to, to watch a little bit more handball in the upcoming weeks because uh, the last week uh, with the Uh, with the international break and uh, we did have uh, the Machine Seeker EHF Champions League waiting for a week as well. So we are back to full strength and uh, I am stoked to see it. I bet you guys are too and uh, I bet you guys are stoked to talk about it next week for once more. Uh, thanks guys for your time. Thanks once again to Alex Duishabayev. It was an, a very interesting talk. Uh, it was <laughs> a lot of time uh, for you audio listeners. Uh, Martin just showed his medal once again. You're such a show off. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, uh, honor to uh, whoever deserves that honor. Uh, Martin, congrats once again. Um, the champion of the champions. Uh, you have the last word I'm in this podcast. I'm just enjoying, you know, the last week that you guys are actually going to call me a champion. So I'm just, you know, sucking it in because next week you guys have forgot it. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm enjoying <laughs> and uh, it's, I'm looking forward to the weekend. Once, <laughs> once you are a champion of champions, you are a champion of champions for the eternity, my friend. <laughs> no one can, that, uh, can take that away from you ever again. It's great. How does it oh feel for you? Gosh. Oh, my uh, gosh. To be a champion. Yeah, to be the champion of the champions. Uh, obviously it feels good uh, no I don't know guys <laughs> <laughs> all right all right uh, Martin oh. can't handle all that honor that is being put to his name oh. uh, but uh, you'll love to see it great sweet I uh, thank you guys a lot and uh, then I would say we uh, hear each other again next week when it's time to talk handball again ball across the Dylan Nahi double in flight oh what a start yeah, into the net He does it again. Yes, I'm going to work on the champion.